What's up guys, Joey here, and welcome to part two of the series for premiumbeat.com in which we create a giant city-sized UFO and make it hover over your town, terrorizing the public. So in part two, we're gonna hop into After Effects and we're also gonna use Mocha to do tracking and then we're gonna color correct, we're gonna add a light wrap, we're gonna add camera glitches, we're gonna do a whole bunch of stuff, a ton of info jam-packed into this tutorial. I also wanna point out that the music and sound effects used in the trailer came straight from premiumbeat.com. There were no outside sources. So they have an amazing music library, an amazing sound effects library. Please check them out and I hope you guys learn a lot today. So now we get to the fun stuff. Let's actually put this alien spaceship in, well, this is Sarasota, Florida, um, but you could put it, you know, wherever your hometown is. Um, all right, so before we get too far into the After Effects stuff, I want to talk about a couple of things that are very important. When you're shooting something like this, right, you know you're going to be tracking a spaceship into the sky, and therefore, you need to make sure that you have some clouds or something in the frame that you can track. If this was a perfectly blue sky, right, then the way I shot this, I would have nothing to track and it would be a million times harder to actually make this look right. So that's step one is make sure that you actually have some clouds or, or something in the sky to track. Um, generally, clouds are what you find in the sky, but I don't know, maybe, maybe where you live there's other weird stuff. So that's part one. Uh, part two, making sure the exposure is okay, right? If you're shooting outside and you have bright white clouds, you can see that I've, you know, part of the clouds are, are overexposed. Um, but I knew that there was enough you know, detail that I'd be able to track. Here's another thing that's maybe even more important. Let me pull up the original shot, okay? This is, and this is the entire thing, but let me pull up just this part here, okay? Because I wanna show you something. If you'll notice, there is no motion blur on this shot, okay? When I zoom in and out, there is no blur at all because I shot with a high shutter speed, okay? Um, even on this part here, when I do my little whip pan, there's no motion blur on anything, right? Now, you may have noticed that on the end, on the end result, there is motion blur. I added that motion blur in in post, and here's why. I knew I was gonna have a shaky camera and I was gonna be zooming in and out, and I really was gonna try and make my tracking as easy as possible, so I set my shutter speed on my camera pretty fast, so I would not have any motion blur, which makes it a lot harder to track, okay? So when you're planning out a shot like this, it's pretty important to think ahead and get those details right. Now here's another thing that maybe some of you are noticing, right? Let me actually just sort of loop this section of footage right in there, okay? Look at what the clouds are doing. And it's kind of hard to tell when they're moving full speed, but if I kind of just scrub back and forth, you'll see they sort of look like they're warping and stretching and doing weird things, right? Well, that, that little artifact that you're noticing is called a rolling shutter artifact. And what essentially is happening is every time my camera, which is a T3i, Canon T3i, every time it takes one frame, it takes one picture, it starts at the top and starts recording and works its way down the frame until it gets to the bottom. Then it goes back up and records the next frame. And the problem is while it's recording, I'm still moving the camera, right? So this is not an instantaneous shutter the way uh, a film camera works. This is a digital shutter and so it actually rolls down the image even though the image is still changing. And so the problem is you can get these stretching artifacts that aren't so apparent when you're just playing the footage and watching it, but when you're tracking, it's gonna throw a lot of you know problems at you, okay? So first thing I wanna do is just sort of figure out what part of the footage I wanna use, set an in and out, trim the comp to the work area, and there's a built-in effect in After Effects that will fix this problem for you. Um, I can't remember what version of After Effects they started including it in, but I'm using CC 2014, and I know it also exists in CC. So if you're using one of those, you go up to Effects, and you've got uh, Distort Rolling Shutter Repair. All right, and here's what it does. Let's go to an especially bad frame, right? Like when we first zoom in here, let me turn the effect off. If I go frame by frame, you see like, like look at that. You can see it, it's stretching it, it's weird. So I'm gonna turn that on and it just sort of undistorts it for me through magic, 
All right, I don't understand how it does. It just does it through magic. And I'm gonna I'm gonna set the method to pixel motion, which takes longer to render, but it's even more accurate. Okay, and so now if I sort of play through this, there's still a little bit of that wiggle, but most of it is taken care of for you. Okay, so this is step one. You need to remove the rolling shutter. Once that's done, I actually pre-rendered out footage that had the rolling shutter fixed. That's this file right here, RS fixed. Let's make a new comp with that. So this shot here is that shot with the rolling shutter artifact removed already, okay? Fantastic. Next thing I need to do is get a good track on the footage. Um, and if you've seen any of the other tutorials I do on School of Motion that talk about this, uh, I like to use Mocha, which comes with After Effects, and it's an amazing, amazing planar tracker. All right, so let's just select this layer. Let's go up to um, Animation and say Track in Mocha AE, and this is going to open up Mocha. Um, uh, and if anyone from Mocha is watching, I so I'm sorry, but I, I never actually register. This pops up every single time. All right, um, and so when you import a new clip into Mocha, it's going to say import that clip. Where do you want to save it? By default, it saves it in a folder right next to the file. The one thing you want to make sure is on is in the advanced tab, you want cache clip turned on. Okay, um, and actually, let me let me set a new project name here so I don't overwrite my old one. Um, and when you have that cache clipped option turned on, the first thing that happens is Mocha is gonna read your entire movie, and it takes a few seconds, but it will cache it, and that's gonna let you play through and track much, much, much faster. So it's always worth the you know minute or two minutes it takes to cache your clip. So let's talk about how, you know, why we're gonna use a planar tracker to track this as opposed to just trying to do it in After Effects, or using the camera tracker in After Effects, okay? So, if you've, if you've used the camera tracker in After Effects and, and you can actually make it work, um, which is not that easy, it's, it's pretty cool because then you get a camera that you can then place 3D layers around your scene and it will work perfectly. The problem is um, it can be tricky to get a really good rock solid camera track in After Effects um, and this spaceship isn't flying all over the place. It's just pretty much staying in one spot in the sky. So because of that, I don't need a camera track. When you're tracking or doing any kind of compositing, you always want to use the least amount of effort that you need to use. You don't ever want to just do it to do it because it can take a long time, right? And if this was for a short film and I had 20 shots to do, I'd want to get this shot done as fast as possible so I can move on. So I deliberately, I deliberately shot this knowing there would be a spaceship here and I would zoom in and look at it and there you go. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to grab, uh, I'm gonna grab a Bezier tool, and I'm just gonna draw. And you know what? I, what I'm looking for is an area of the clouds that has enough contrast that um, I think I'll be able to track. Okay, so I don't want to just grab like this area here, but in here there's a lot more detail. So I'm gonna grab maybe this piece, just like that. Okay, and then I'm gonna tell it to track backwards because I'm in the last frame and it's gonna start tracking, okay? Now, I am going to pause the record and let it track all the way through. All right, so Mocha is done tracking and it tracked pretty much just perfectly and then it got to about here and when it started to go off frame, it lost the track and stopped, so that's why these frames are red. And I don't really care about that because, you know, this, this swish pan, this happens so fast that um, I'm just gonna turn the layer off when I don't need it, and I'll turn it on when I do need it, okay? So now we've got a good track. So the next thing we need to do is set up a surface for that track. So um, Mocha can output, it can output two types of tracking information. Position, scale, rotation, like you know a null object, it could give you just, just transform controls, or it can give you a corner pin. Because I, I pan the camera, right? I turn it, right? And the UFO is going to enter from this side of the frame and then move more into the middle. And then I'm zooming, right? The focal length of the lens is changing. This thing enters from the edge of the frame. So there's going to be lens distortion. So the shape of this should be changing a little bit relative to where my camera is and how it's pointing at it. And so a corner pin is going to give me a much more accurate representation of what the object's doing. Okay, so to set up a quarter pin, you have to have a surface set up. So you hit this blue button up here with the S on it, and it's gonna give you this blue box, and I'm just gonna grab the edges of the box, um, and I'm just gonna sort of eyeball about where I want that UFO, 
right? You can see it's really big in the frame there, and then it's a little smaller at the beginning. Um, and I'm not too concerned, because I know I can adjust this in After Effects, and I'll show you how to do that. But I do want to check my track and see how well it's working. So a good thing to do is select the layer of your track, say Insert Clip, and I'll just pick the logo. And this will let you import the Mocha logo and hit spacebar, and because you've cast your clip, you can pretty much play it, and in real time see, yep, that looks good. That really does stick right in there. Cool? That's how easy it was to track. How ridiculously easy was that? So next, go to uh, select your clip, say export tracking data, and make sure the format is set to corner pin, and there's two corner pin options. Select the top one. Copy to clipboard, and then we're gonna go into After Effects, and I am going to, uh, I'm just going to add a solid layer in there just as a placeholder. We'll call this UFO. And go to the first frame and hit paste. Okay. And what it's going to do is going to copy all of these corner pin keyframes. Right. And it's going to paste that solid in there for me. And I can see it's tracked in there perfectly. All right. Next thing I'm going to do is replace that solid with my actual UFO footage. So I'm going to pre comp this. I'm going to hit Shift Command C. And I'm going to leave all the attributes in here. So it leaves the corner pin in this comp. And I'm just going to call this UFO underscore PC for pre-comp. Now I can come in here. I can delete my solid. And I'm going to bring in my 3D render. Now here's my 3D render. Okay. Um, and I'll show you exactly how I import that. So you can see and make sure that there, you don't have any mistakes. Because there are some little gotchas with stuff like this. So here's my C4D renders. Um, and I rendered an image and a multi a multi pass image. So you'll see here's one set of files, but here's my multi pass render. So I'm going to grab one of those. Make sure I have open EXR sequence checked. Bring that in. First thing I need to do is tell it the correct frame rate because After Effects guesses 30 frames a second, but it's not. It's 24 frames a second. So I need to right click and say Interpret Footage Main, 24 frames a second. I also need to make sure my alpha channel is set correctly, pre-multiplied or straight. Now, I, this is a setting that you set inside Cinema 4D, and I set mine to pre-multiplied, so that's what I'm going to leave it at and hit OK. I can now drag this UFO down here, and you can see all that's happening in this animation is it's rotating very slowly. Okay, there you go. And that's it. Now let's come here, and now you've got your UFO tracked into your shot. All right? And if you're happy with it, then you're done, okay? But what if you want it to be a little bigger or a little lower or something like that? The built-in corner pin effect doesn't give you any control. It doesn't let you adjust anything. There is a better effect in the distort menu called CC Power Pin, right? And there are some cool scripts that you can download that will actually let you create the power pin effect instead of the corner pin effect. But if you don't have them, this is an easy way to fix it. What you do is um, you, you go to the first frame, put keyframes on top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right, and then hit U on your layer to bring up everything. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy upper left, paste to top left, copy upper right, paste to top right. And just as quickly as that, you've transferred these keyframes to the power pin, and then you can delete the original corner pin, right? And you get the same result. The difference is with the power pin, you get some extra options. You get this expansion percentage, right? So let's say I decide this is too small. I want that to look bigger, right? I can expand the top, left, right, and bottom by the same amount. So let's say we expand it by 10% in each direction. Now this is 10% bigger, but the corner pin still works perfectly, okay? Beautiful. Um, and I could actually go into my UFO pre-comp and lower this a little bit if I wanted it to be a little bit lower in the sky. Okay. Uh, I want it to be a little bit higher, so let me go back in there and just raise this back up. There we go. All right, so let's just do a quick RAM preview of every other frame, which is Shift and Zero on the, key, on the number pad. Let's you preview every other frame and just see how this track is working. Make sure everything looks good. All right, and you can see that this that, that UFO sticks in the sky perfectly. The track worked great. So we are, you know, we're about a third of the way there already, and it hasn't been much work yet. So we spin around, and we see the UFO. There it is. Now, first of all, we don't see the UFO. We shouldn't really see it until 
maybe this this might be the first frame. So I'm gonna move the UFO, I'm gonna move the start point of it to that frame, and then I'm gonna scoot the layer over, okay? Um, and so now, let's just double check when we go backwards and forwards. Does it look like the UFO just pops into place or does it look like it comes out of the side of the frame? And it may, you may want it to start to peek out here and then you'll see it, right? Maybe, maybe we should see it one frame earlier. So uh, what I'm gonna do is just, I'm gonna slide, I'm gonna hit Y, right? Y brings up your pan behind tool and I'm actually gonna slide this layer back a little bit. And you can see it's leaving the keyframes where they are, but it's sliding the actual layer. And so I can have it up on that on that one frame. It doesn't look like it's in the right spot on that frame though. You see how it jumps, right? So on that frame, the corner pin is wrong. So what I wanna do is actually just, just kind of fake this. So I'm gonna delete all of the keyframes that are bad, right? And so on this frame, it's there. I'm gonna put a position keyframe on the layer, and then I'm gonna go back one frame, and I'm just gonna manually kind of nudge this thing where I think it should go. It should be kind of on the edge of the frame, kind of up here, and I'm just gonna jump back and forth until it looks right. All right, so manually getting that first frame in there, perfect. Okay, so now we've got the track. Let's start working on the composite. So the obvious thing is this thing looks really, really dark uh, and it doesn't match the colors and all of those things. So one of the, th one of the things that happens uh, as a cue, right, to tell you how far away something is, is it, it is called distance fog. So you know, this kind of goes back to like Design 101. If you want to tell the audience something is far away, you can make it smaller. Um, and if you have perspective, you can place it, you know, in perspective so that it's clear that it's further away. But you can also do things like fade it back into your canvas. So right now we are in this more or less blue environment. And you can even see if you look at parts of the footage, if you look at this house that's further away, it, it feels a little bit bluer and further away than this house, which is much closer, right? So that's because in Florida, it's very, very humid and hazy. And so this would be faded back. It wouldn't be this dark and it wouldn't be that saturated. Um, so I wanna color correct it. So I'm gonna put a levels effect on it. Now you can, that's not levels. Now you can um, you can try to eyeball it, right? And if, you, if you're experienced with color correction, you know, you might be able to get away with kind of just eyeballing it. That's not generally what I like to do. What I like to do is go channel by channel and color correct one channel at a time, meaning I'm gonna set this to red and then I'm gonna look at the red channel. So you can click this button and say red or you can hit option one, which brings up the red channel. And then I'm just gonna use this uh, histogram to make this match, right? And so what I'm looking at is, you know, how dark would this thing really be, right? it probably wouldn't be any darker than that car. So I'm gonna increase the black output. And also, you can see that all of the values of that uh, of that channel are kind of in the back here. So I'm first gonna set my white to sort of the white most thing on that layer. And then I can, then I can actually adjust the white output level and adjust the gamma to kind of match, right? And so I wanna adjust the, you know, the black output basically raises the black level, so it makes everything brighter overall. Um, and because it's far away, because it's reflecting um, stuff off the ground, and, and you know, it, it, should be, it shouldn't be like this rich, dark black. It should be a little bit more faded like that. Okay, same with the whites. You see how bright it is in there? If I hold my mouse over, um, you know, this part of a cloud and I look at the values, that's not truly white. You know, but if I hold my mouse over part of the UFO, like over this pixel, um, the red component is actually greater than one, meaning it's 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 brighter than white. Um, by the way, the reason the values are going from zero to one is because I'm in 32-bit mode, which is usually what I use when I'm compositing. So if you're not in 32-bit mode, hold Option and click that number until it says 32-bit. It will help your composites. It'll it'll work better for you. Um, and so then I want to push my white output down um, and probably bring the white input down too. Um, and if you're having trouble, which I am, you see I'm, I'm trying to get these pixels to not be so bright. They are brighter than white. They are above one, 
Well, if you're having trouble with that, you can set the clip to output white on, and now those pixels can never be brighter than one, which will let you darken everything overall much easier. All right, so let's zoom out, and oops, I did not mean to put another position keyframe there. All right, so that's starting to work. We're probably gonna have to come back and, and adjust this a little bit, but Here's before and after, right? It's clearly blended in there better. We'll do the next channel, green. So switch levels to green, switch to your green channel, which is option two, and do the same thing, right? We can um, we can just sort of look at other things in the scene, right? Like that car, and try to make that UFO look like that car. And now that car is much closer to the camera, so it's not exactly gonna look like that. Maybe more like that roof of that house, you know? Like, it should look like it's faded back, like it's just not quite as rich as everything else. Then I'm gonna switch to blue, it's the blue channel, and wow, the blue channel is very bright, right? Because you've got this incredibly bright sky. Um, so nothing should really be that that dark in it, right? It should be pretty blown out like that. And now I'm gonna go back to RGB and take a look at it. Okay, so if I do before and after, that is way better, so much better. It's very blue though, very, very blue. So you could just go back into the blue channel and just try to manipulate it while looking at this, right? I could grab the gamma, which is a good sort of middle range adjustment, and just pull it out a little bit and get rid of the, some of that blue, that will help. Another thing you could do if you don't like working that way, I've used levels a lot, so I kind of know how to use it. If you don't, just use another effect. Go to color correction and use color balance. That can help you. And that way you can literally pull blue out of the midtones, for example. You can just pull some of that blue out, right? And you can see that now it's sort of balanced out the colors of that UFO and it's sitting in that scene a lot better, right? Um, now one thing, maybe you guys noticed it, maybe you didn't, but when, when I zoom in, the brightness of the scene goes down. The reason for that is because I'm using a very cheap lens, the one that came with the camera, and a lot of zoom lenses, they actually, you know, they, they change the f-stop when you zoom. So um, they, they actually change your exposure. So I'm gonna have to manually kind of mimic that because I color corrected this for the wide shot. When we zoom in, it's, gotta, it's gonna have to get a little darker. All right, so let me show you how I did that. Um, I'm just gonna use another levels effect, actually. And I'm gonna call this zoom adjust. I'm just renaming my levels effect. And I'm gonna go forward until right before we zoom, right there. I'm gonna set a keyframe on the histogram. Then I'm gonna move forward till we stop zooming, which is right about there. And now I need to darken this thing, right? So I'm gonna start by just adjusting the gamma, darken it a little bit. And I'm also gonna bring the black level down so it washes out even more and I'm gonna bring the white output down too. All right, and um, let me, let me, um, let's see here, what do I wanna do? I wanna uh, hit U to bring up all my keyframes, but I wanna close down the power pin. And I'm gonna hit the J and the K key to jump between these two keyframes. And what I wanna do is look at this frame and look at this frame and try to figure out if they are matching. Uh, and the truth is, they are not matching at all, really. Okay, so this is gonna have to get a lot darker than that. Let's see, and a lot more washed out, too. There we go. All right, so now I'm just gonna sort of play through that and see what that looks like, right? And this part was actually pretty tricky to do in the demo. Um, I also wanna set these to easy ease. There we go. And what I'm trying to get is I'm trying to get that zoom to happen where I don't really see much of a shift. Okay, so it's it's kind of a tricky thing to do, um, and it took me a while to really get it to look smooth. Um, and I may actually want to move this keyframe over a little bit. Um, and really, this part I just had to play this a whole bunch of times and stare at it to figure out what was working and what wasn't. It also looks like it starts to get a little bit brighter right after this, right? So I may wanna put this keyframe here, and then let's go back a couple of frames, put a keyframe in the histogram, and then move that keyframe back here so it'll get dark and then bright again, all right? And that's not bad. I think with all the other effects that we're gonna add on top of it, that's gonna, that's gonna sit in there pretty well. 
Cool. So we've got a good basic color correction. Let's talk about some other things. If I go to full res here, look at the quality of this footage, right? This is a, you know, decent but not amazing DSLR camera. So you're not getting pristine edges, you're getting a little bit of noise, but look at my CG. Look how absolutely pixel perfect that looks. So that is gonna be a dead giveaway. So I'm just gonna first off just blur it a little bit because it's just too sharp. So that's easy, fast blur, maybe blur it, you know, a pixel. Just soften it, just even a pixel can really help. And then I'm gonna add some noise to it. So I like to use noise HLS auto as opposed to add grain. Add grain is a much slower to render effect that adds film grain. Noise HLS auto just adds noise, but in most cases that's okay, right? And if you look here, you see all this color, like you see how this gray in the clouds actually looks like there's some red and some green and it's kind of noisy, right? That's because that's the way a digital sensor works, especially one on sort of a prosumer DSLR camera. So I'm actually gonna, so I'm gonna set the noise to grain because if you set the noise to grain, it lets you size the grain up. And then I'm gonna set the lightness to like 2% and I'm gonna set the hue to maybe like 5%, right? And if I crank this up, you'll see it adds a lot of noise similar to what's going on in these clouds. And then I can crank the grain size up a little bit, right? Maybe set that to like three. That's probably too much. Set it to two um, and turn that hue down. It shouldn't be that high. It's really like five. So this is before, this is after. I don't know if you guys can tell on a screencast, but when this is moving, having that noise on there that resembles the noise in the footage is so huge and so key to having it blend in. Another thing I'm kind of noticing here is that the color of the light in there is so saturated compared to everything else in the scene. I mean, this is a pretty saturated sky, but that's above the spaceship. Everything below is a little bit more desaturated. So I think I need to take the saturation down on the spaceship. Um, so I'm just gonna add another effect and I'm just gonna bring down the saturation overall just a little bit. Let's see, so that's before and after, right? It's subtle, but that's kind of the trick with compositing. Compositing is all about training your eye to see those little details um, and, and finding those little nuances that make that CG or make whatever it is you're compositing jump out as fake. All right, so color-wise we're doing okay, saturation-wise we're doing okay, and we've even added a little bit of noise to this thing. Fantastic. Now, here's, here's another thing that jumps out at me. I don't know if it jumps out at you guys, but if it doesn't, start looking for stuff like this. The sky is above this spaceship, and that is what is, that's the light source on top of the spaceship, and it should be very bright, right? But if you look here, this edge, it doesn't really look that bright. Um, and what, what tends to happen is when you have a sky that goes above something, um, you're gonna see kind of spillage of the light on the edges of that object, and that's called a light wrap. So we need to create a light wrap on the top of this UFO. All right, so what we're gonna do uh, is we are going to take our background. Well, first thing we need to do is take this UFO that has all of our effects and our power pin and all that stuff, and we need to pre-comp it. And we need to move all the attributes into a new composition and call this UFO pre-comp, okay? And the reason we did that is because what we're about to do to create a light wrap, it will not work if the layer is moving around. It needs to be a pre-comped layer. So now I'm gonna duplicate this and I'm gonna call this light wrap, okay? And I'm gonna move it above my UFO and we're going to use, in the channel group, we're gonna use the set mat effect, take the mat layer from our UFO and invert the mat. Let me solo this for a minute. This is another trick I, I've shown in, in a different tutorial, um, how to create your own light wrap in, in After Effects. I'm basically taking this UFO layers alpha channel and knocking out uh, knocking out my layer with it. Once I've done that, I'm going to add a fast blur. I'm just gonna blur the layer a little bit. Turn on repeat edge pixel so I don't get that little halo around the edge. Then I'm gonna duplicate the set mat effect and uncheck invert. So now I've got the shape of my UFO with the edges kind of showing a little bit of that background through, right? And if I turn that on and off, you'll see that it just helps sit that UFO in there a little bit better. Uh, I'm gonna set the mode, sometimes I set it to add, 
Um, but that's usually if, if there's a really bright object behind my, my foreground. In this case, it's not that bright, so I'm gonna try screen mode. Um, and you can adjust the opacity of it. 100% might be too much. Leave it maybe at like 50%. And you know, here's a before and after, before, after. And it looks great, except I don't really want it on the bottom part of the UFO. I only want it on the top part. And this is just me nitpicking, but the sky is very, very bright. The ground is, you know, reflecting a lot of that light, but it's not nearly as bright. So you wouldn't necessarily get as much of an of a light wrap on the bottom as you would on the top. So I wanna mat that out, okay? Now here's the problem. If I wanted to just have a mask around the top of the spaceship so that's all that I saw with the light wrap, um, that would be kind of a pain because this spaceship's moving in the frame and I don't really wanna to have to manually keyframe a mask around that. So I'm gonna hop back into Mocha for a second and I'm gonna export tracking data again except this time I'm gonna say use transform data, copy to clipboard. What that's gonna do is gonna let me paste position, scale, and rotation data onto a null. So now I'm gonna make a new null. We're just gonna call this track. Uh, you gotta go to the first frame when you paste it and hit paste. And now if you look, you'll see, especially if we move forward here, that there is a null which is somewhere and you can see the anchor point. It's This is one of the weird things about Mocha. Uh, the first time when you do this, it copies it kind of in this dumb way. And here you go, here's your null. The null's way over here, but the center, the anchor point of the null is there and it's in the right spot. So the first step uh, when you copy position scale rotation data from Mocha is un turn off the anchor point stopwatch and then zero those values out, okay? Now. There's the null. You can see that it tracks perfectly um, with our spaceship. And what this is gonna let me do is it's gonna let me parent things to that null that will track with the spaceship. And it won't track exactly because the spaceship, remember, has a corner pin on it. But for a lot of things, it's gonna be close enough, right? So if I make a new solid, and let's just make it really bright pink so it's easy to see, and we're gonna call this light wrap matte and it's above the light wrap, and I'm going to parent it to my null, my track null, and let's scale it down, all right, and rotate a little bit, and what here's, here's what I'm gonna use it for. I'm gonna draw a mask on this layer that will mat out, so I only have the light wrap on the top of my UFO, but because I have this nice little null, my mat is gonna track with it automatically. So it's pretty slick, saves you a lot of work. So let me set this temporarily to an adjustment layer so I can see through it. Let me scale it up a little bit. And I'm just gonna grab my pen tool, hit G, and I'm going to just draw a mask only around the top like this, okay? Turn off the adjustment layer. And now I can set my light wrap to use that layer as a mat. And then I can feather this mask too. I can just select the layer, hit F, Feather that, maybe 50 pixels. And so now if I turn this alpha mat off, you see we get the, the light wrap on the bottom. And as soon as I turn it on, that goes away. And now the light wrap's only on the top of the UFO. And it's just that little 2% detail that helps it sit in the scene a little bit better. Awesome, cool, all right? So we now have a UFO in the scene, color corrected fairly well. It still might be a little bit dark. Right, um, and so now I could just do an overall color correct. Right, remember our color correct is actually buried now in this pre comp here, but that's okay because we're working in 32 bit mode. Um, you're not going to lose any quality by just stacking color corrections. Right, so I could just add another levels effect here, um, and I'm just going to bring the I'm going to bring the black level up a little bit more, just so it's a little bit more faded back. And I'm gonna go into the blue channel and just add a little bit more blue in too, just a little, right? It's a subtle little shift there, um, but that's gonna help sell it. Cool, so now let's talk about how to add the motion blur back in. Um, the way I do it is actually it uses a third party plugin, but it's one of those plugins that you know, if you're serious about being an After Effects artist, you're probably just gonna have to pony up and buy at some point. It's not that expensive. Let me pre-comp this whole thing, call this UFO Tracked, okay? 
With this whole thing pre-comped, I'm gonna select that layer and I'm gonna put an effect on it called Real Smart Motion Blur, okay? This plugin is amazing. What it does is it looks at a source and it compares one frame to the next and adds motion blur to it. And it does it pretty quickly and it does it really well, right? Let me let me go back a few frames here and let's just do a quick RAM preview. And you can see that even with that really fast swish pan, it adds motion blur in, right? And because now it's adding the same motion blur to my footage and to the UFO, it is really gonna help settle that thing in there, right? That's that's another good compositing trick is affect your footage and your CG the same way, right? There we go. And now there's motion blur and it looks more natural and we're really we're really helping sell the illusion here. Awesome. Okay? So, now I'm going to go back into uh, I'm going to go back into my tracked comp here. Now let's talk about how we can get some cool kind of heat distortion, smoke coming out of this thing, okay? So uh, what we're gonna do is basically create a displacement map and we're gonna use fractal noise to do it. So I'm gonna make a new comp. Let me just come up here, I'll make a new comp and we're gonna call this smoke noise. And I'm gonna make a new layer. We're gonna call it noise. And I'm just gonna put a uh, noise fractal noise effect on it. There it is, there we go. All right, now Fractal Noise is one of the most versatile plugins that comes with After Effects, can do all kinds of neat stuff. And there's a whole bunch of different types of fractals it can create. And so, you know, it's a good idea if you haven't done this, just kind of look through and just like look and see what kind of interesting results there are, right? There's a lot of different types of noise. Some look like smoke, some look like, you know, weird electricity stuff. Um, you know, I kind of like this smeary one for some reason. I thought that was interesting looking. And you can, if you play with this evolution setting, you can kind of see it almost looks like a swirling liquid or something. And I thought that might be interesting to use um, as a displacement map. And, and here's the brilliant thing is we can change it whenever we want. So let's take this noise uh, and let's have the evolution keyframed. Let's, and, and whenever I use fractal noise and I want this evolution to just keep moving constantly, I use a simple, simple expression. So rather than set a keyframe here, go to the end, and then animate this, and then play it and say, oh, it's too slow, so I need to come back over here and change this keyframe. Rather than do that, I'm gonna hold Option, click the stopwatch, and type in time times, I don't know, 300. Right, now I can RAM preview it and say, oh, that actually feels pretty good, but if it didn't, I would just come in here and change this number, all right? And this will ensure it moves at a constant speed forever. The other thing I wanna do is I want the noise to be moving down, because this is gonna be like smoke or heat or exhaust coming out of the UFO. So it needs to be moving down. The way you move it down is using the transform tool here. And you can offset the turbulence using this property, right? And so I just wanna offset it down like this. So again, you could set keyframes and do it that way, or you could use a simple expression. So let's uh, hold option and click on this to open up an expression box. And let's just say, um, so again, this, this if you're not familiar with expressions, there's several tutorials on my site that deal with it, schooloftmotion.com. Uh, so I'm gonna gloss over this, but basically this offset turbulence property needs an X and a Y value. And the way you return that in an expression is you open a bracket and you type in the first value, which is gonna be the X value, which I don't really care what it is, it can be zero. The Y value is what I'm concerned with, and that value I want to be time times I don't know, 100. Now you close the bracket. Now let's RAM preview this and you can see that it's gonna keep this still horizontally, but vertically it's gonna move it by 100 pixels every second. That's too slow. Let's change that to 200. And so this makes it a lot easier to sort of find the speed of the noise you're looking for, okay? Also, because remember, we talked about this in part one of this, this is a very gigantic object very far away and I'm seeing far too much detail here. So what I wanna do is turn the scale down on this thing, right? So I can get a lot more detail out of it. There we go. All right, so let's try that, smoke noise. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take the smoke noise, put it in the scene, and parent it to that tracked null, okay? Um, and it doesn't need to start until this frame. So here we go, there it is. And let's just sort of roughly position this where it needs to be, okay? This is gonna be coming out of the UFO, 
and let me turn the opacity down on this layer for a minute, and let's just take a look at it, okay? So that that size is gonna let me mask it out, um, and I don't want it to actually be hitting these palm trees here, because if it did, that would mean I'd then have to rotoscope the palm trees, I don't feel like doing that. So here's what we're gonna do, we're gonna pop in, and I'm gonna do a quick mask. I'm gonna go into full res by hitting Command J, so I can see this better. Um, and I'm gonna take that smoke noise layer, grab my pen tool, and I'm going to draw a mask like this. And so what I'm doing is I'm tracing the inside edge of that UFO's kind of opening. And then I'm gonna come down here and I'm just gonna make a shape like that. Cool, all right, now we can turn the opacity back up. Awesome. So when the exhaust is coming out of the spaceship, that edge should be pretty hard, but I do want to feather it a little bit. So I'm going to hit F, and I'm going to feather this mask, I don't know, two pixels maybe. Uh, maybe that's not enough. Something like that. Just a little bit of a feather there. But down here, I want it to be much more feathered. So one thing you can do in After Effects, and this is a relatively new feature. I think it's only a couple of versions old. So you set up your mask shape, right? And then you can come up to your pen tool and grab the mask feather tool. And the way this works is you um, grab, grab it again. Somehow I didn't grab it. Uh, you can add points. You, you click on a mask point or somewhere on the mask like this. And then when you click and drag that new point, it will feather the mask for you. But if I add more points, like if I add a point here and a point here and a point here, now I can selectively feather parts of my mask and not others, okay? Um, so this is very useful, and you can even do the same thing with an inside mask too. So I'm just gonna reshape this so that I get a nice feathered edge at the bottom, but not at the top. I don't want the top to be feathered. All right, so let me suck that in like that. Okay, cool, and let's just zoom out, go to half res, do a quick rain preview, and just look at the speed, right? The speed of that noise coming out of there, okay? If it's coming out too fast, it's gonna hurt the illusion that this is this enormous thing hovering in the sky. So you wanna make sure that it's not going too fast, and that might be a little bit too fast, but we can always adjust it in the pre-comp. Next thing I wanna do is use this as a displacement map. So if you wanna use that as a displacement map, I need it to be displaced and I need it to already be tracked to the UFO. Um, so, which means I need to pre-comp this. It's the same reason when we made the light wrap, we had to pre-comp the UFO. So I need to pre-comp the track null and that noise layer. So I'm gonna duplicate the track null and I'm gonna select track two. I'm gonna, I'm gonna parent smoke noise now to that duplicate. And now I'm gonna select both of those and pre-comp it and call it smoke noise pre-comp. Right, and so again, now this pre-comp has no keyframes on it, but the smoke moves around on screen wherever it needs to go, which means now I can use it as a displacement map. So let me turn this off for a minute. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add an adjustment layer called distort. So this will just go over the entire comp, make an adjustment layer, and I'm gonna use an effect in the distort group called displacement map. Displacement map takes any other layer and it, and it literally displaces pixels um, by whatever amount you tell it based on the luminance or the red channel or the blue channel. I'm gonna use the luminance for both horizontal and vertical. And I'm gonna tell it to use my um, smoke noise PC. And now it's all set up to distort. And so let's zoom in and if I just sort of play this, you can see that it's shimmering a little bit in there, not very much. So let's, let's turn this up to 10 and 10. So it'll distort more, all right? And now, I'm gonna zoom out, I'll just do a quick RAM preview and let you guys take a look at this. So what's happening is the uh, it's using the black and white value of that smoke noise layer, which remember is a pre-comp where we tracked a fractal noise layer to the UFO and there's animation on it. And so as you watch it, you can sort of see that it's pushing, it's cool. You can actually see that the distortion is moving sort of down, okay? and it just sort of helps, it adds a little atmospheric something. The other thing I did was I duplicated my smoke noise layer um, and, I, and I turned it on so you could see it. 
And then I set it to screen mode. And I'm gonna color correct it a little bit. Let's put a levels effect on there and crush the blacks a little bit, right, like this. Uh, and because we're in 32-bit mode, when I crush the blacks, I'm actually darkening the footage underneath it, which I don't want. Um, I just wanted to use screen mode to get rid of the black, so I need to make sure I clip my output black and turn that on, okay? So now I can't darken the footage, but I can just hide parts of the smoke, um, and I could blur this layer a little bit. Let me just put a little fast blur on there like that, uh, and then let me turn the opacity down a little bit. So now... It's just gonna let you see a little bit of that texture that's in sync with your um, with your displacement map, and it's gonna sort of resemble like you know a little smoke or steam or fog or something coming off of it. And I probably crushed those blacks a little hard. Um, I don't want it to look too fake, so let's bring that back a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Maybe more like that. Okay. And let's do a rain preview. So now, um, you know, you've got your displacement map, you're seeing a little bit of the steam come out, and everything's color corrected, you've got a light wrap, you've even got a comp set up to put motion blur on this. So what are some of the finishing touches that we're gonna need to do? All right, well first let's let this RAM preview finish. And you know, overall, but let's just do a quick recap. We talked about fixing the rolling shutter. We talked about getting a good track in Mocha, exporting the data as a, both a corner pin and transform data. Uh, and we've talked about making your own light wrap, color correcting the footage to match, switching to use the power pin effect. I mean, there's been a lot going on in this tutorial and I hope you guys are following along. But this is looking pretty cool so far. You know, I could nitpick it. There's some things I probably want to tweak. But at this point now, this is where I wanted something to happen. So what I did was I had a bunch of little flashes kind of appear inside the UFO. All right. So let me show you how I did that. Um, I used one of my favorite plugins, which if you, if you don't have it, just go buy it. I mean, Andrew Kramer, you know. He really is responsible for uh, you know the prevalence of, <laughs> of lens flares because he made this awesome plugin called Optical Flares. Um, so what I did was I just you know went into the presets and um, you know I, I usually just try to grab a preset. I don't always build these from scratch, but um, I tried to find something that looked a little bit maybe I don't know synthetic or mechanical or something. Um, something that had a little bit of like a shape to it that, you know, and then what I also like to do is go through and turn off certain parts of the lens flare. So like these little, uh, these little bokeh that are kind of coming out here, if I can figure out where they are, um, I like to hide those. And really, you know, I just want to, I only want to see this kind of stuff. Actually, I like that. Uh, I want to hide that. I'd like to maybe hide, yeah, that gigantic square down there. There we go. So I just want this stuff, right? Just that stuff. Hit OK. Um, and I'm going to tint it so maybe it's like kind of that cool alien teal color. It's probably too saturated. All right, let's bring that down a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to set this to color dodge. Okay, and so now I've got a lens flare. Um, and it's, a, I don't know, I mean, I used a different lens flare on the uh, demo, but this is kind of interesting, right? It's a little techy. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make a new null, and I'm gonna call this flare null, and I'm gonna parent it to the track null. So now what I've got is uh, another null, and I'm gonna use this null to control where the lens flare is. So I first need to tell the lens flare to show up where that null is. The way you do that is you, you, put, a, you put an expression on the position property of the optical flares effect. Uh, hold option, click the stopwatch, and you wanna pick whip, right, from the expression to your flare null to the actual null. Not to the position property on the null, but to the null itself, and then type in dot, to comp just like this open parentheses and then put a bracket with zero comma zero comma zero in there close your parentheses there you go all right um if if you go watch uh, any of my expression tutorials you'll see this and you can probably copy and paste it but that's the expression that basically tells the position of the optical flare to match wherever this null is on screen 
all right? And so what's cool now is let's say I decide that right about here I want a quick little boom, boom, boom flare. Well, what I could do is put a position keyframe here and then hold Command and Option, click and make it a hold keyframe. Then on the next frame, move it over here. On the next frame, move it here, right? And now I've got a cool little th three frame like flash. Now in addition to moving the flare, uh, what I'm gonna wanna do is adjust the brightness too. So let me set the brightness to zero, all right? And put a keyframe there, hit U, and set that, set that to be a hold keyframe and just scoot it way back here. So on this frame, I want it to be, I don't know, that bright. Then it jumps, and now I want the brightness to go down a little bit. Then it jumps again, I want it to jump back up, and then on the next frame I want it to go back to zero. And so by using hold keyframes and using this null, you can get these cool little flashes, right? Um, and if that's, you know, if it's if it feels too quick for you, which it might, it feels a little bit fast, um, I may want to add, you know, add a couple extra moves here, right? So take the null, move it back over here, move it over here, move it back to the middle, and then come to the brightness and have it dim down a little bit, have it get really bright, and then dim down a little bit, and then go to zero, like that, okay? Cool. So now you get this little flashiness, and it's like jumping around, and, and you could really, um, you know, I, you could even push it further, have the null really like move to the extremes of this. Um, the more jumpiness you get, the more violent it's gonna feel, because this is supposed to be this enormous spaceship, right? So when you see stuff like that, now, one thing that's kind of hurting it is the scale of the lens flare. It's so big, um, you know, and again, things are very small when they're far away. And it's not really supposed to be a lens flare. It's just sort of a techy, lighty, glowy thing. So I'm just going to turn the scale down a little bit. Not that much, just a little bit and see if that helps. Yeah, that works better now. Cool. Greatness, all right? So I did this and I had it happen a couple of times. And then at the end... I had it happen one last time and really blow out, like really start to blow out the frame like this, okay? So let's talk about what I did next. So let's hop into our, uh, let's go up one level, all right? I'm gonna hit tab to bring up my flow chart and go up one level to this comp. And this is the comp, remember, has real smart motion blur on it. So I'm getting motion blur on all this stuff too, which is cool. Um, so in this comp, the other thing I did was I color corrected my footage, and I like to use a, a plugin, which just sort of it's a, it's an awesome time saver and it's really fun, and it is called Red Giant Looks. Um, and if you've never used it, it is such a fun plugin. I highly highly recommend it, and it lets you just sort of you know just try out a bunch of different looks like this, like, oh, that's cool, but it's a little bit blown out, so maybe I'll just adjust it a little bit. Um, you know, I'll bring the lift, bring the lift up a little bit, bring the gain down. I mean, you can really go crazy uh, with this plugin, and I love it, but it doesn't come with After Effects, and maybe it's not, you know, maybe it's not an option for you, so I'll also show you some tricks I use to color correct stuff just using built-in. Um, so I've got an adjustment layer, and I like to use curves to kind of get a little bit more contrast out of it, right? And this shape, this S-curve, this is sort of mimicking the way um, film actually captures light. You know, it, there, there's usually like a little bit, uh, it, it, you know, it's a little bit darker in the blacks, and then it kind of levels out, and then it captures the whites even a little bit brighter. And so it just gives you a little bit more contrast, right? And, and I'm going to kind of go back and forth between a few frames because I don't want it to get too bright and blow out the clouds. Um, and let's push the mids down and maybe push the blacks up a little bit. And there we go, right? So now I've got like a nice basic contrast. Now there's an alien spaceship over the city, right? And the colors are just very neutral and bright and sunny. So another thing I like to do is use my color balance effect. Um, and add or take away color. So, you know, let's say we wanted this to feel really creepy and alien-ish. Uh, what I might do is push some green into the shadows and push some, uh, and then remove some red from the midtones, right? And and probably desaturate it a little bit too. So let me actually also add hue and saturation effect, okay? Um, and I want the hue and saturation to happen before the color balance. 
And really, I'm just adding green and I'm taking away, I'm adding an unnatural color and I'm taking away natural colors, right? Like there's automatically a lot of blue in the highlights because we're outside and there's a blue sky. So if I subtract blue from the highlights, it's going to, it's gonna bring in sort of more, less natural colors. Um, and so if I turn color balance on and off, you can see that it gives it kind of a, a little cast. Um, you can also go into the hue and saturation and if you have a predominant color like this blue sky, go into your blues and you can desaturate that a little bit or you could even push it and make it make it go a little bit teal, right? Even push push a little bit of green into it um, and desaturate it a little bit. And, and so you can just use, I mean, these are really the three big ones I use. Curves, hue, saturation, color balance, and of course levels I use a lot too. And just using those, you can you can really change the tone of your piece. And because I've color corrected the footage and the UFO and it's, there's motion blur on it, and I've color corrected it all as a whole, it's just one more layer of glue to help hold this composite together, right? Um, and then, you know, it would not be a Joey Kornman composite without adding a vignette to it. Um, I literally do this, I'd say, on 99% of the things that I produce. Uh, I usually just use an adjustment layer with levels where I'll, like, I'll push the levels a little darker. And then I'll grab an ellipse mask like this, and I'll invert it and feather it. And there's your quick and dirty vignette. Um, and so now we've got a color corrected, vignetted, motion blurred, tracked, light wrapped, uh, heat distortion, you know, there's a lot going on. We've even got a few lens flares that are that are acting like these little these little flashes, right? Um, so let's hop forward in time to where those flares happen, and I will show you the last piece of this, which is how I did my little glitchy effect. All right, so here we are. This is where those little lens flares happen, right? So this is where I wanted it to. I wanted it to capture that feeling like you've seen this a million times in movies where the aliens do something and all of a sudden all the electronics go crazy. And so that's why I wanted the glitchiness. I wanted it to be like, uh-oh, the video camera is messing up because the aliens are using their weapon, right? So there's a million ways to make a glitch effect in After Effects. And there's a lot of tutorials about this too. So don't just do it this way. There's 10 million ways. But I just did it this way because I thought it would be nice and easy to control. I made a new comp called noise, and I'm gonna make a new layer called noise, and we're gonna use fractal noise again. All right, I told you fractal noise was versatile, and now I'm gonna prove it. So I'm gonna set the noise type to block, and it's gonna make this very pixely, interesting looking noise, and I'm gonna go into my sub settings, and I'm gonna turn sub influence down to zero, and watch what happens. It keeps the overall big noise, but it gets rid of all that extra kind of transparent noise in there. Okay, so now I've got this very pixelated looking thing. And what I wanna do is I wanna have it jump around a lot. So if I animate the evolution, you can see that you can have the evolution change slowly, but I want it to happen really quickly. So what if I just hold option, click the stopwatch, and type in time times 5,000, right? If I do a little RAM preview of this, you can see now I've got this crazy jumping pattern, right? It changes on every single frame. So I'm also gonna uh, scale this up a little bit. All right, let's go back to our transform and scale this up, okay? So I have big chunky noise and I'm gonna turn the contrast up too. There we go. Then I'm gonna duplicate the noise and I'm gonna set this copy to screen. And on the copy, I'm gonna scale it way down like this, okay? Right, so now I have some big chunks and I have some small chunks. Um, and I could actually set this to add. Sorry, here we go. Add. And by setting it to add, it, it's actually because I'm in 32-bit mode, it's gonna brighten and darken certain parts, right? So you're getting a ton of variation in the blocks and the texture. Um, screen, I actually liked a little bit better, so let me just leave it on screen. Cool, all right. So what the heck could I do with this? Well, what I wanna do is create a mat out of this and use that mat to mess with my footage. So what I'm gonna do is pre-comp both of these and call this noise pre-comp. 
okay? The reason I did that is because if I turn on my transparency grid, there is no transparency yet. And that's what I'm gonna need in order to use this the way I want. So let me, um, let me now take a white solid. It doesn't really matter what color it is. It could be blue, it could be anything. Put it underneath your noise and use it as a luma mat, okay? Set this layer to use the noise as a luma mat. Now I have transparency. And it's this crazy glitchy transparency like this. So now I could take that noise layer. All right, let me turn my color correct and my vignette off. And what's cool is now, because there's an alpha channel there, I can make this noise an adjustment layer and it's not gonna do anything except if I now put an effect like magnify on there. And I change the shape to square and I crank the size of it up, right? It's moving around and it's actually not moving um, and I think I know why. Let's go back into our noise comp really quickly. Go to the beginning and you see you've got this nice, crazy, glitchy, noisy thing happening and when we get to the end, it there it is, it stops, stops. Why is it stopping? Well, remember I have this expression on here uh, on these noises, time times 5,000 on the evolution. Well, After Effects actually has a limit to how high it will start, rend it'll render things and you can see the evolution's still going up, but it has stopped changing this. So apparently that number is too high. And so that's why it stopped animating. Um, no worries though, because it doesn't really matter. All I need is that glitch, and I'm actually gonna rename this glitch adjust. Um, I don't need that to exist until here, right? And here it is still moving. Cool, so now if I play this, you can see we are getting a really glitchy, crazy look. Whoa, my gosh. Now, I don't want the entire frame to be messed up like that. So I'm gonna grab a mask, rectangle mask, and I kinda just want it like, you know, kind of a little bit random over parts of the image like this. Um, and I only want it to last for a few frames and I, and I kinda want these things to move around too. So I'm gonna hit um, option M on all of these actually. So I can put a mask path keyframe on all of them. And then I can, again, command option and click on the keyframes and make hold keyframes. And that way I could animate, I could animate the shape of these things, right? So it can be really big on this frame and then this glitch can be over here now and this glitch can be over here now. And then on the next frame, this can be more on this side. And you know, you can see that you're doing hand by, you know, frame by frame animation here, but it can still be done very quickly. You can just kind of drag things around and, you know, and then, um, you know, if I wanted to, I could even just sort of loop these keyframes. Uh, this one hasn't moved yet, so why don't I move him over here and then go back and move him somewhere else so he is kind of moving a little bit. Um, and then I could have the glitches go away, right? And I want the glitches to happen let me turn this off for a minute. Uh, I want the glitches to happen just after we see that, that first flare, right? So there's the flares. So I actually want the glitches to start here. So I just hit the left bracket key and it moved my layer to this point. And now we turn it on and you can get those cool little, little glitches. There we go. So we get a flash and then, whoa, dude, look at that. And you saw how easy that was. And because it's an adjustment layer, if I want it to happen again, I just duplicate it and move it over here. And now it'll glitch over here. And you can always adjust where the masks are and all that kind of stuff. Um, so on top of this, uh, what I also did was I, um, so here's my, this is my noise comp right here, right? This is what I'm using to actually create the displacement. What I also did was I took this comp, pre-comped it, put um, an effect on it called Colorama. Colorama. Here we go. And Colorama, it takes uh, either the luminance or alpha channel or some aspect of an image and it maps different colors to it. So I wanna use the alpha channel of this. So I'm gonna say get phase from alpha. Um, and then here's my output cycle and you'll see it's gonna randomly create these colored blocks based on what the alpha channel is. And you can change this output cycle if I don't want the primary color to be red. Um, I can actually just animate the phase shift. So let me, let me just make it more like this. Um, 
And what I really want to do is I kind of only want these little blocks. I don't really want the big blocks as much. Um, so what I'm going to do is first, I'm going to put a curves effect on here. Here we go. Um, and I'm going to bring the white all the way down to zero. And then I'm going to grab a point here and kind of go like this. And what I'm trying to do is get rid of as much of the bright parts as possible, right? And just kind of keep the mid-tones so that when Colorama happens, you now, you don't have as many of those big chunks. You just have all this crazy digital noise, right? And I can adjust the curves kind of interactively to get the result I want. And what's cool is because I'm using the same noise that I used for my magnification, right? I can now take this, let me rename this noise too, and I'll call this color noise. Um, and you can see that the alpha channel is a little messed up here. So I'm not gonna be able to just use a straight alpha channel on this. What I'm gonna have to do is put this on top of my glitch adjust, line it up, right? So it's the same length and it starts at the same time. And I can just set the mode. I could set it, I could mess around. I could set it to add or set it to overlay and see what that looks like. You can try different things. Um, I think add, it's gonna work okay. And then if I want to, I can even copy my masks from this layer. Um, so I think I'll do that. I'm gonna go to the first frame, select all my masks, hit copy, and come up here and paste, right? And now you even get that little digital noise that just happens to line up perfectly with the magnification distortion that's happening. If you wanted to, it could be off, or I could just offset the color noise maybe by a couple of frames, right? So it doesn't line up perfectly. And now you've got this neat little digital, you know, H264 mess up glitchy thing with not much effort that you can totally adjust. And if you don't like these colors, you know, change them. Go into the color ROM and pick what colors you do want. And I don't know if I want them to be that, you know, I want them to be a little more transparent. So there you go. Um, with that, I think that is gonna be the end of this tutorial. We have gone through so many things in these last two videos. We modeled a UFO, we talked about UV maps, texturing, lighting, using HDR, rendering, creating greebles, and then we've talked about tracking and, and adding motion blur and removing rolling shutter, and oh my God, this is like possibly the most jam-packed two tutorials I've ever done. So first of all, Thank you so much to Premium Beat for asking me to do these. These have been so much fun. I really hope you guys got a lot out of them. Um, check out Premium Beat's sound effects and music collection. It is amazing. All of the sound and music that I used on the demo for this came from Premium Beat directly. I did not use any outside music or sound effects, and it is super affordable. I highly 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 recommend them um and if you like these tutorials and you want more like it also please check out schoolemotion.com my own site uh, i have a lot of stuff on there and i know i'm going to be partnering up with premium beat a lot more it's a great company great bunch of guys um and i look forward to showing you guys more cool stuff just like this thank you very much I want to thank you guys for watching. I hope you learned a lot and please check out premiumbeat.com if you need stock music or sound effects. Super affordable but super high quality. I can't recommend them enough. And if you like tutorials like this, please check out my site schoolmotion.com where there's a lot more content just like this. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you next time.